All right, so in the interest of time, we'll get started. Um, this Zoom is also being recorded, so for those who have to back out early or miss the beginning, be a way to view it later. It will be accessible on the online exhibition website um, in the near future. But thank you everyone here today for joining. My name is Lexi Johnson and I'm the curator at the One Archives at the USC Libraries. I'm delighted to have Mary Naomi joining me for the second in a series of conversations as part of the exhibition, Safer at Home. For the exhibition, which I've been creating in real time, I've been selecting items from the One Archives collection that resonate with and reflect on the idea of Safer at Home. While the exhibition began as a way to reflect on the ordinance issued as a response to the coronavirus pandemic, it now applies equally to the protests in response to police brutality. They are, of course, inseparable. COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting marginalized individuals. Police are killing black and brown and trans individuals. Thus, I want to probe what safer at home means in a world shaped by structural racism, classism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and ableism. Whose safety, whose home, as defined by whom? Using archival material as a lens, this project will continue to pose questions and challenge ideas about space, place, and activity in relationship to safety and freedom. These archival materials act as a mirror, bringing the past into the present and offering perspective on what is happening today. They highlight people, events, and activities from the past but offer inspiration and comfort, as well as challenge in the present. To complement these archival selections, I thought it was essential to include the voices of queer of color contemporary LA-based artists in this project. I have invited four artists to participate and their work is available online in the exhibition. In addition to today's conversation, I am also planning an in-person exhibition of all of these materials when it is safe to do so. I wanted to do something generative now but also offer the opportunity to see these items in person as both something to look forward to and a way to continue this conversation. Before I introduce Mary Naomi and we dive into today's conversation, I want to make a few housekeeping remarks. This conversation is meant to last about 30 minutes. We will discuss her work, thoughts and reflections on the current moment. There may be time for questions at the end, but I encourage you all to post questions into the Q&A box um, which should be at the bottom of your screen if you're on a computer and uh, might be located elsewhere if you're on a tablet or other device. And if we don't get to all of the questions, we will try to get them answered in other formats and available um, on social media or on the online exhibition afterwards. And this conversation is also being recorded, as I said, so it'll be available later as well. And now, as a way to begin, just a bit about today's artist. Mari Naomi is the award-winning author and illustrator of the graphic memoirs Kiss and Tell, a romantic resume, ages 0 to 22, Dragon's Breath and Other True Stories, Turning Japanese, and I Thought You Hated Me, and the Life on Earth graphic novel trilogy. Her work has been featured in many publications, websites, and museums, including the LA Review of Books, The New Yorker, The Smithsonian, The Cartoon Art Museum, and The Asian Art Museum, and the Japanese American Museum. She is the creator and administrator of the Cartoonists of Color, Queer Cartoonists, and Disabled Cartoonists Databases, and co-hosts the podcast, Ask Bi Girls. Thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this project and being here today, and I can't wait for our conversation. Hi, thanks for having me. Also, Black Lives Matter, Trans Lives Matter. Yes, let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's talk about all of the above because I, as I tried to say in the introduction, I feel like this safer at home rhetoric really applies equally um, to what was initially just the pandemic, but of course, the police brutality, protests against police brutality that are happening now and that they can't be separated. Um, so I think our conversation, hopefully, will get to all of those and more as we continue. Um, so You've shared with us some of your daily comics for the online exhibition and exhibition which will be in person. So I thought um, I'll share my screen now just so people can see some of those as we converse. And I thought we could just start by you sharing a little bit about this practice of daily comics. Um, how long have you been doing it? Um, how has the series grown over time and kind of your relationship to this daily practice? 
Well, I've done daily comics before. Usually when I go traveling um, a lot, on a lot of book tours, I've done a lot of um, diary comics just to keep track of what's going on and just for my own personal use, but I'll often share it with people on social media. Um, these came about when, it's sort of a long story. In 2014, I started the Cartoonists of Color database and, uh, and I quickly, after that, started the Queer Cartoonist database. And recently I started the Disabled Cartoonist database. But when I started the first one, I thought, you know, this isn't cheap um, to do. I wanted to figure out a way to fund it. And so I started a Patreon, which nobody joined. Um, but I was trying to figure out like, how do I, how am I gonna, you know, what am I gonna offer other than, well, I offered nothing, which is maybe why I, I didn't get a lot of joiners at the time. Um, but then, so that failed. What I really didn't want to do was diary comics. And that was when Patreon started, everyone was doing diary comics. And I just didn't want to do it for other people. Uh, and then year, like several years ago, I decided to... I already had my own personal Patreon, which ended up getting quite a few followers because I, I do have rewards. Um, and that is ultimately what funds the database. So, you know, yay, it worked, sort of. Um, but so I already had that going and I thought it'd be really nice to have diary comics just for myself so I could remember what happens. I, I, I'm pri pr primarily a memoirist. Uh, as far as comics go, my first four books were memoirs in, gra in graphic format. And so I, I, I have a lot of uh, complicated ties to facts and, and misinformation and memories and, and how, you know, memories versus facts and how that goes. And, and I just, I, I realized that I just really enjoy looking back on old diary comics, especially, and, and since they were all travel comics, it kind of put me outside of my normal life and I think I was I was averse to doing them before because I thought my life is boring unless I'm traveling or doing something odd I'm like I just sit around and I play with my animals and whatever so I just but then I decided you know it's really nice having this maybe I'll just start it for myself and I you know I since I have this Patreon I might as well just share it with them and see how it goes mm -hmm. and it was, a, it was a very interesting uh I guess is it still an experiment if it's going on four years later? I don't know. Uh, it, it, was, it was interesting to see how my relationships to the comics changed over time. At first I was, I, I mean, I have no problem sharing too much information with people because that's sort of what I do uh, in daily life and also as a career. So, uh, so that wasn't a problem, but, but getting feedback in real time was was odd because I noticed it started to affect how what I was writing about um it's, it's, it's just been very interesting and I've told myself the entire time as soon as I get sick of it I'm just gonna stop and I guess I'm not sick of it yet <laughs> that's how it started that was great and and reflections on how it continues and I'm interested now you're looking back now on this huge body and you shared for the exhibition five comics so even just the kind of act of going back and looking back at what you recorded each day um what that is like and how kind of recent current events the pandemic the protests um being stuck at stuck at home um or not stuck at home and how all of that kind of has seeped in and where you see it and kind of that experience i don't honestly really look at the old comics very often unless i'm uh requested to for example by you pick out a few comics so so it was it was interesting going back and seeing how how the pandemic snuck into my psyche because really the comics are just a reflection of what's going on what I find the most interesting that day um, the practice of it is every day like I, I used to draw them at the end of the day or maybe the beginning of next day or maybe I'd spend all day the next day drawing them now I have a very strict rule that uh, I don't draw it until the next day with a few exceptions, but I don't draw it until the next day. I draw it over breakfast or right before breakfast. And, uh, and, I, don't, and I don't take more than 10 minutes to do so. But I might think about it as I wake up. Um, so, it, so it just gives me a moment to reflect and remember, you know, okay, what was it about yesterday that really stuck out? And sometimes it's a funny thing that someone said to me or something cute an animal did, or maybe it's, you know, suddenly that we had a horrible curfew and that 
our civil rights were being impinged upon. You know, it could go anywhere. It's, it's, it's like, it's funny like that. Um, <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> Yeah. Did I answer the uh, question? I'm sorry, I forgot. The yeah, question. I think so. <laughs> well, that makes sense for sure. And um, it acts, you know, for you as a way to kind of assess what happened the day before, and then those who are who either um, register on Patreon or are viewing some on the exhibition. It's a way to see through someone else's perspective, kind of what that one moment was that you wanted to record. If it was something funny, if it was something hurtful, poignant, kind of all of the above, um, and then it functions well for someone else to reflect, did that happen in my life? Did that not happen? Can I relate? Do I not relate? You know, how is something different? So that's what I enjoyed seeing the work um, from the opposite. I try not to be too historical about it because I know that other people are recording what's actually happening out in the world. And, you know, that, I don't feel like that's my job. <laughs> my job is to, is to do diary comics. Um, but sometimes I feel like I'm not doing enough because I'm only giving myself 10 minutes to draw and I draw them in this very tiny square. I, I can't see myself on the screen, but if you could see me square, it's a, it's very small. Um, it's like two inches by one and a half inch. So I'm like putting a lot of information into a tiny square or maybe not so much. But still the record adds up and I think it's important to have it all kinds of records out there, including these um, comics. So I guess now pivoting a little bit and thinking about your practice and how it started obviously well before the pandemic, safer at home and the curfew orders of recent, um, but has continued obviously. And so maybe you could think and speak a little bit with us about how your relationship to home and working at home has changed. I know for some of those people who signed on early, you heard us talk about our pets a little bit and relationships, <laughs> um, but just thinking about that, um, yeah, relationship to work, home, life since safer at home, staying at home, the curfews, et cetera. I mean, most of that stuff is internal. I, honestly, I've been working from home since, since before 9-11 because I remember being at home and working from home when I found out about the World Trade Center. So I've been doing this for a very long time. I've been freelancing for a very, very long time. I'm very comfortable with not leaving the house or seeing people for a very long uh, amount of time. And it's partly why I have so many animals because I can, uh, and I can give them lots of attention during the day. Uh, so, so my actual everyday practice didn't change. I, uh, my partner, he, uh, he now works from home and that's actually changed a lot for me because now I have someone else in my space where I'm used to being alone most of the time, except, you know, he'd come home for dinner and, and sleep, obviously, and on the weekend. So, so that's been annoying. Um, <laughs> I mean, we get along really well, but I'm just very used to my own space. And, and he's, he's very thoughtful about giving me my space. And, and I'm very, very, very lucky in that I have a studio that's separate from my, ho my house. Um, it's, it's on the same property, but I have to walk to it. And it's, it's, I'm just really glad that I have that so glad and uh so i've been using that a lot um i think the biggest difference aside from his presence uh his constant presence in my life is uh that just the anxiety of not knowing what's going on or of knowing what's going on because it's equally as terrifying sometimes uh just just the um God, i i I want to say uncertainty, but that's not how I feel. It's, it's just um, worrying about people, um, just high levels of anxiety. That's, that's the biggest difference. So before working from home or just working or just living, existing would be, it was, I'm a pretty happy, zen, comfortable person most of the time and, and lately not so much and very lately really not so much. I've never been a fan of police. <laughs> um, I've had a lot of uh, just firsthand witnessing police brutality, police harassment. So all of this has just given me flashbacks to my, my youth being harassed and stuff like that. Um, and then the curfew, which is like, really, you can't give people a curfew to save their lives, but you can give them a curfew because you don't want them exercising their freedom to protest. It's, 
it's been pretty distressing. Um, but surprisingly, like it seems like things might be changing. I, I don't want to get too optimistic about it, but seeing that Minneapolis is changing the thinking of defunding the police, like that's amazing. And and just over the past, I don't know, 24 hours, I've started maybe being a little less cynical. It's crazy. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I've, done a, uh, I've done a lot of protesting in my life. I've done a lot of activism. I've not been to the protests um, for various reasons, uh, health wise and pandemic wise, but you know, I absolutely support them. Uh, but yeah, so I've had a lot of a lot of first-hand accounts of with police at protests and most of the time when when I was at the height of my protesting time um, there there weren't video cameras on phones and um, it's amazing that there are now Yay. right now I think I mean the pandemic for sure is something they said you know exposed questions that have been or problems or issues, structural systems that have always, that have been happening, but now because people always. are, because there are more cameras on cell phones, because people have more time to spend on social media, because there's more shared hurt, all of those things, shared experiences seem to be hopefully exposing things anew. And um, there's, there's moments, moments to hope. And I was also thinking about um, just getting to a different comic. Um, so obviously you shared comics from the past that now seem equally relevant um, in the present moment. So thinking about how exactly these, these experiences and things um, repeat, and it's not that they didn't happen before, but maybe they're being highlighted or showcased or people are able to see them in a new way today. So just bring this up, thinking about um, the endur endurance and duration to which um, protests need to occur and keep occurring and how in the midst of that um, we make time to take care of ourselves and um, to take care of others and those we care about and those we love to make sure that that we can continue um, the spikes that he said this is not this is not the first time we've seen police brutality and you've experienced that in the protests before so I guess more of a comment than a direct question but just how um, your work from before kind of any of these acute time periods, but the kind of resonances that carry through. Yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of the fun thing about the co just having a daily practice. And I, I encourage other people to do it as much as possible, even people who don't think they can draw or don't think they can write. I think it's, it's really fun because not it, it's different than having a regular diary a regular diary you're trying to put down everything or you're trying to put down a lot whereas when you're limited to one small page or one so, small square of this is how much you're allowed to talk about and especially if you have to spend time drawing i mean i know the drawings are pretty scratchy but it's 10 minutes and it takes me a long time uh but I, I feel like what you really have to kind of meditate on what you're drawing and sometimes in the middle of drawing it you might change your mind and like scratch out something and and, and go in a different direction it's it's uh it it helps give perspective which which i really like um and it helps boost my memory and i've always it's funny i'm i write memoir but i've always had a really terrible memory memory but i write everything down so that helps and uh, maybe before I get to my next kind of question that I sent in advance, just maybe a question on comics. Did you always know that you wanted to draw comics um, or how did you come to that path? And what are some of the kind of unique affordances that you feel comics offer and why you continue to make them and graphic novels too? Well, it's funny. Uh, so I, I wanted to be a, a writer from the age of I, three or something before I even knew how to write. <laughs> but my dad wanted to be a writer, so I think I just wanted to be um, a white male. I don't know. <laughs> oh well. Um, so yeah, I've always I've always uh, wanted to be a writer. I thought specifically novelist. I don't think memoirists were uh, were a thing until not that long ago. It, was, it, it feels like memoirs were reserved for celebrities like who who cared about what anyone else had to say so uh so i i would write these terrible books actually <laughs> growing up uh i wrote one when i was 18 and another one when i was 21 like it's like 300 page novels i mean they were i don't know they, there might have been something redeeming in them i i cringe when i try to look back at them um 
because it was just me trying to figure out my sexuality, really. It's pretty pathetic. Um, I mean, great. It's great. Uh, you do that in 500 pages, I think you're doing well. <laughs> it yeah, helped me sort, of sort things out, and I had diaries. Anyway, I was, it's funny, because when I was younger, I was very keen on getting to know myself, and now that I'm, you know, nearing towards 50, I'm like, I know myself pretty well. What was the rush? Like, <laughs> it's kind of fun to have some mystery, but whatever. Um, so anyway, I wanted to be a novelist, and it went, and so I wrote a couple of novels, and I was talking to people in the publishing industry, and uh, longer story short, the publishing industry is brutal, and I guess I hadn't really thought of that side of it when I was, wanted to be a writer. I thought, oh, I'll publish a book, and that'll, I could quit my job, and da 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 and and apparently it's harder than you think to get published. And, um, and uh, I, yeah, I, I decided, no, I don't want to be a writer. And this, by this time, I was in my 20s. And, and I'd wanted this since I was a tiny child. And so I was like, uh. And around that same time, I, I got a job writing. I was doing video game writing, which was amazing. And so I was like, okay, so I was meant to be a writer, just not what I thought I was. And at the same time, I started reading comics and specifically underground comics in the 90s um and i just i, I love them and as i read a comic in the twisted sisters anthology by mary fleener called the jelly and that was the moment where i realized hey i have i have some pretty messed up stories i could i could share those and i love drawing and i love writing and oh i could just do this and but it never occurred to me that this would become a career it just seemed like a fun thing to do and that's how it started my first comic was drawn in February of 1997 and finished in March of 1997 mm -hmm. and uh and then I got my first comic published the, the next year I think 98 so you know in an anthology so and, and I was doing that for the longest time and I didn't end up getting a book published until I think the contract was signed in 2009 and my first book came out in 2010 or 2011. So long time, 14 years of obscurity. And then suddenly the comics took off. And then, um, and I was still writing for video games at the time. And, and I just got so much uh, comics work at that point, that low paying comics work versus high paying video game work. But I just, at that point I was partnered with my husband and, and I was like, uh, you know, I'm getting all these offers and this is really cool. Um, but they're for like no money, you know, should I pursue this? You know, what do you think? And he's like, well, so I said, would you rather be married to uh, a poor cartoonist or a pretty well-to-do like middle management writer type person? It's like, go for the comics. And I'm like, okay, yay. So here I am. <laughs> yeah. That's how that happened. <laughs> Thank you for the, the whole story. <laughs> the the comic artist now running three comic artist databases and oh my gosh that's so separate <laughs> so i guess yeah. i had a question too about um thinking about the themes for this exhibition and kind of themes for our times as well and thinking about comics as a, a medium of course that showcases our highlights our privileges uh humor and how your comics are often funny but also hold space for emotions like sadness and pain and hurt and so thinking about the role of that humor and levity and kind of how it um, tempers and buttresses and pushes forward um, and addresses structural racism and other systems of, of, of oppression, excuse me. So thinking of kind of about that balance, but it of course isn't really a balance, but one and the same. Um, and I can scroll to whatever comic. I mean, I think it's true in this, this one that you colored for us, um, but in all of well, many other as well. I thought I'm not super deliberate. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't find, I don't think I'm that manipulative with humor, but maybe that's just so ingrained in me. Like I, I, I've always used humor to diffuse a situation, like with, you know, any situation, every situation. So that just, that just comes out in the comics, I guess. So it's not really like premeditated. <laughs> not that you're meant to be a comic artist. <laughs> I do think I mean I do think humor is so important but I mean obviously time and place like there when 
very recently when I saw what was happening at the protests, like I, I think for a good half day, I lost all of my sense of humor, which is very unusual. Even my gallows humor, like that was even gone. And that's, that's pretty intense. Um, but yeah, I think I'm, I'm pretty jokey all the time. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe just as a question to wrap up, and I'll encourage those who are listening in, if you have a question, please write it in the Q&A box below. Um, but my qu final question um, for this conversation, which I'm trying to ask everyone, and I think we touched on a little bit earlier, this idea of hope. But for me, uh, visual art and artists remain an integral part of, of our fight against all forms of oppression. And so from your perspective, I'm wondering what you feel like art or comics or graphic novels can do for us in these current times and what drives you to keep making and doing your work. I feel like art in all, all the forms of art, all it is is just um, a conversation. It's just another way to express yourself. It's another voice. Um, I, I definitely feel like it's easier sometimes, not easier because it takes a lot longer, <laughs> to express myself with a comic than it is in a sometimes with a conversation I mean you, you see me I'm saying um a lot I bluster over things like even if I if I think too much about it then I'll get tied up tongue-tied whatever but if um if I email I'm a little verbose about it but with comics I have to really kind of narrow it down and and get to the point and I also have time to really think about it and and, and uh, to truly express myself and I think that's I have so much practice at this point that that is my most effective means of communication. And so that's, that's what keeps me going because I'm a talker. <laughs> yeah. For those constraints of whatever podcast or the comic give way to kind of the creativity and the uh, conversation that you want to have. I love doing the podcast too, though. I have to say that's, uh, that has the instant gratification. There's, there's so much that I love about it. Um, and it's so much less work than making a comic, which I like that about it too. And I could say a lot more in a shorter period of time, but I don't know. I feel like the comic, the, it's just different. Like it's not, I, and I also don't think that I'm going to be doing comics forever. Um, mm -hmm. I still do other things. I, I'm just not as well known for the other things that I do. And I, I, just, I, I love expressing myself in all sorts of ways, but I, I do think comics are, they're special. They're, they're, they're exceptionally difficult, which makes me love them. <laughs> <laughs> a good practice, a daily challenge. They should be called <laughs> a daily comic, but important now, forever. Um, <laughs> well, I don't see any questions in the chat, but if people think of them later, please send them our way and we'll, I'll get them answered. Um, and I just want to thank you for Mary and Naomi for being part of this project and conversation. And I know that we'll continue again when the exhibition is possible to have in person at the archive. So thanks oh, so much. Be amazing. Thank you, Lexi. It's really nice to be here. And please, kitty cat, come out of the nerve of the blanket. <laughs> <laughs> He's asleep. <laughs> oh. <laughs>